Before Rachel came along, I knew that there were deaf people, but I had no clue about their lives or their worlds, or I didn't know a single deaf person, never met one that I knew of. It was a struggle because we didn't know what to do. There weren't people that we could find that could really tell us. We just had to figure it out on our own. And then when we take her to the deaf school and we, we begin to meet this whole other world that we didn't even know was there. I mean, a culture that is so fully developed. It was new every step of the way. Faith, for example, was a very important thing to me. How do we communicate to her in this silent world, God is still relevant? That was my biggest concern. I started writing songs when I was just a, actually a child. I, mean, I think it was six years old when I did my first song. And then in high school, I, I wrote a lot of songs and uh, then touring with tour groups and singing around the country. That was probably my primary profession for a long time. The thing I loved about music so much and still do really is um, it's an extraordinary way to express all kinds of things. You can write songs to teach things or illustrate history. I love the fact that I've been able to spend a lifetime writing little songs that say important things, I think, to people who hear them. That's one of the things that I identify with the most, one of the things I am as a songwriter. Everything about that is oral, depending on the years. I, I never really gave much thought to deaf people. I knew they were there, but I didn't think about them. At least before Rachel came along, it was just a hearing thing, you know, you get up and you perform, but then, then it changed. I had just recently turned nine when I found out that I had a sister coming. I was pretty excited. I wanted a sister, you know, a baby would be cool, I thought. <laughs> there was a lot that was being said and done about um, playing music when you're pregnant and, and with small children and it helps them and everything. Well, one of our very traditional songs is, I am a child of God. And so I sang that. That was important for us, that our children know that from the very beginning, that God is watching over them all the time, that that's a heritage that they have, thinking he or she is going to probably be musically inclined and let's get a good start on some of these good songs here. When she was born, the doctor came in and said, everything's fine, she's good, healthy. She was very cuddly and relatively quiet, inquisitive. She was probably a month old before she even cried. It was just, she liked to snuggle. She was very different from Carol. We didn't have any expectations except that we were hoping that she'd be a healthy child. That's what we prayed for and that's what we got, a healthy child. After a while, you, you do start seeing things and, and wondering, you know, why isn't she paying attention? And of course, with our older daughter, sometimes she could just tune things out too. And we thought that was probably what was going on. She didn't make any noises to mount anything at all. And then when she did start babbling, there was no mimicking. You know, children will mimic what they hear. You know, you're starting to say words more for them to try to get them to do that. And she didn't really seem to want to imitate words very much. So we began to think that there may be an issue with her hearing. But we went to the pediatrician and we said, can you check her hearing? Because at this time, they did not do that in the hospital before the child was released. So our pediatrician did a tympanogram, which basically shoves a puff of air into the hearing canal and measures the movement of the eardrum. So there was no problem with the movement of the eardrum. And she assumed that behind the eardrum, everything was okay. So she said, no, I, you just have to be patient, mom, dad. She'll talk when she's ready. She's just gonna drink it in, you know, and try to learn it and then she'll, she'll talk. But months go by and so we go back and go back, nothing, just, they just keep doing the same test. And finally, when she was about 15 months old, she had just finished her afternoon nap and it was kind of a rainy day, it was in the summertime and I went in her room, uh, she was standing and fussing as she looked out the window, but her back was to the door. So I called her name, Rachel, 
No action, no reaction whatsoever. So I called again, Rachel, louder, still no reaction. And then finally I, I, I yelled as loudly as I thought I could without getting in trouble with the neighbors, Rachel, nothing. Then I flipped the light switch on and she wheeled around and I got the big grin. And then I knew right there that she wasn't hearing us. She just wasn't hearing us. That was when we took her in for the hearing tests. I sat in a room with her and they had to do an auditory brainstem response. They would send sounds, clicks, through her ears and they would measure brain waves. And that's the way they could tell what she was hearing. The audiologist was able to tell by watching the computer screen. And he said, well, uh, I'm sorry, but your, your daughter is profoundly deaf. Uh, significant hearing loss in both ears. 95 decibels down in each ear. That's really low. That's called profoundly deaf. He moved the tissue box near us, and he was expecting tears, I guess. Well, we didn't cry. We already knew that. We knew that before they did. First thing that I said was, well, God has a special plan for her. Because things like that are part of what happens in life. But whatever those things are, there's usually some place where God has a place for it. Even you know, if it's a really great good thing, or even if it seems um, like a difficulty, this is something that has turned out that changed our lives in many ways. So what's the next step? Where do we go? And they told us about the implants and said, the, uh, but that, the, she wouldn't really be a candidate for that because she has this much hearing. And if she gets the surgery, then she loses all of that. So she won't have anything and they won't permit us to suggest the implants. So we decided we would see how hearing aids worked. So we got hearing aids uh, on both ears, bilateral hearing aids, to see how, how they do. She did not want those things in her ears. And I remember sitting in my room thinking that I was very upset with my parents <laughs> for making her put them in her ears because I didn't think she needed them. She didn't have to hear. All of a sudden, she's hearing some things she's never heard before. So she was confused, and it was irritating, and, and uh, it was difficult to, to get her used to that. Second day, she didn't fight quite so hard. Third day, OK. Fourth day, she brought them to me. So clearly, she was getting some stimulus that she wasn't getting before. We kind of assumed that, well, with the hearing aids, it's not going to be perfect, but adults who wear hearing aids, once they get the hearing aids in, they get their hearing back, they, they proceed. She was able to start to unlock what, what words meant, the language. But after almost two years of trying the hearing aid route and paying for as much speech therapy as we could afford to pay, working with her every day, you know, trying to help her read the lips and trying to figure out things, she didn't, she didn't have any more than maybe 40 or 50 words. It was a pretty, pretty limited. My wife and I just felt that this just wasn't getting it done. It wasn't going to happen. The hearing aids were not going to be the magic elixir for her. So we were going to have to find some other way to go. We went to a county services and somebody met with Marshall and he took her in and this person taught them a few signs. She seemed to like that, so she wanted us to bring a book and she could make the sign for book, you know, like that. But it wasn't very fast progress. She wasn't learning a lot of vocabulary because we didn't have a way to reinforce a lot of that by the time she was four years old. Marshall came home with her and said, the person suggested something. I don't know if you're gonna like it or not, but this person suggested that we send her away to school. Well, that was the gut kick. Send her away, put her in school away from here, residential school. It just didn't seem like the right thing to do. I couldn't imagine anybody wanting to do that kind of thing. 
But then we started to talk about it and we decided to go down to the deaf school and check it out and start trying to find some people that we could talk to about this to see what we needed to do. At first, I didn't understand what was going on. I didn't realize the point behind me being here. But I think intuitively, I did pick up that this was something special. It was a place that was going to be very important to me. Exactly why, I didn't know, and I couldn't ask about it because my vocabulary was so limited. Within the first minutes we're there, Rachel was introduced to these other children. She ran to me and she pointed and pointed to them and pointed at her ear and pointed to them and say, same, me, same, like me, like me. She saw these other children had hearing aids. And I'm, I'm dissolved in the tears. And this was eye-opening for us too because we realized that she knew that she was different, you know, and, and now she was seeing kids who were like her and that was exciting for her. She was just really eager to get into these classrooms where these kids were and sit down and play with them because they were the same. That's something that, I, that is part of the human spirit. You will never get away from the need to know that there are others like you. There are others that struggle with what you struggle with. It, it's part of what makes us human. She went to be in a classroom and to play with the other kids, and then we came in to a conference room with a couple of the teachers, the audiologist that was down there at the school, the school psychologist, and some other people, and they explained, they gave us a little bit of history of deaf education. They told us all about the things that they were going to do there. They were in the forefront of this bilingual program that they would learn to sign as well as try to speak, but sign language would be the foundation. We believe that a deaf child can have it all. So this means that American Sign Language is used, written English is used, and spoken English if possible. We encourage the use of all three modes in the classroom, and we do place more emphasis on written English and American Sign Language. They said, if, if Rachel came here, what would you want us to do for her? What would you want us to do? And I said, well, I, I'd like you to teach her how to be deaf. Cause I don't know how to be deaf, and she needs that. So she's not gonna be able to get that from us. We, we, we need somebody who can teach her how to function in the world as a deaf person, how, to, how to, um, to acquire the skills that she needs and how to be a success, even though she's, she's got this hearing issue. For them, just to ask that question to me is remarkable. One of the teachers started to cry a little bit, had tears in her eyes. And I thought, man, what did I do? I, 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 did I hurt somebody's foot? Did I say something wrong? I have no idea. And she said, well, Mr. Lawrence, we can do that. We are skilled at that. But it's just that nobody ever asks us to do that. She said, you have no idea how many parents, hearing parents come down here with their deaf child and they just want us to fix the child. Um, it's almost as if they come down and they say, teach our child to hear. We can't do that. We can't make them hearing, we can't. But we can show them how that they can, they can succeed if, as a deaf person and that there's a world there that they can access as a deaf person that they, they can't even access as a hearing person. That's a very, very powerful question. That tells me they are focusing totally on Rachel's needs. My wish would be that every hearing parent could come to the table and ask that question. We had had a good deal of training in communication theory and the whole concept of self-talk. We talk to ourselves all the time. We hearing people hear words in our heads. Well, if you can't hear words, then how in the world are you gonna to talk to yourself? You have to have some language that you can own in order to be able to move beyond a simple fundamental concept like chair and that's what that looks like. 
into abstract thought where you can move ideas around and and look at things in different ways. And that requires, pretty much requires language. The more language you have, the better you can do that. If your child needs something, you do it. If your child isn't able to walk, you get a wheelchair. If your child can't hear and can't learn language through the normal way, you do what you need. And if it means there's a different language there, you'll learn that language. Rachel had to have a language to think in or she was always going to be somewhat limited in what she could do. Now, in, in her case, English wasn't gonna get it done. We'd already tried that for two years. We did everything that we, we thought we could do. But if she had a language that she didn't have to hear, sign language, it's a fully functioning language. We had already learned that. It's not based on English. And so if she could learn that and acquire that, now she could begin to think and dream I thought of it as if we don't do this, we're going to handicap her even more than what she is because we're denying her something that she needs to have or we're giving it to her in a very limited way and it's going to hamper her development um, if she can't acquire language. So we did place her in the deaf school and that was traumatic. That was the hardest part of the whole experience with putting her in the school and getting her adjusted to that and us getting adjusted to it. And it was a residential program. So that meant that she would be living at the deaf school through the week, come home on a bus on the weekends. What a crummy thing to do to a child. <laughs> Three hour drive on the weekends in a bus. Where we lived in that county, all of the children who went to the deaf school in Indianapolis met at a certain place. The school systems got together and provided a bus that traveled down there. So on Sunday afternoon, they'd take the bus, get them down there in the evening, and they would be there until Friday. And when school was over, they'd get back in the bus, come home with their dirty clothes or whatever, and be home just for about a day and a half. I said, I can't do that. I got to I got to take this I, this is my baby. I got to take her down myself. And I'm going to stay with her a day or two. Mr. Lawrence, I don't think that's really best idea. You just you need to just kind of let her go. I said I can't let her go. I just can't. She needs to know that I still love her. I didn't even really know exactly what was going on with my parents because of my limited communication. I don't remember packing. I think I probably thought this is just another family trip we were taking. I don't remember exactly the trip, but after arriving, I looked around and realized I had been to this place before. I went into the classroom and I met my teacher there. I remember she crouched on my level and said, hello, and she signed teacher to me, but I didn't even know what that sign meant. When she came to my classroom, she was almost five and she had no language to speak of. What I saw was a little girl with very, very bright eyes, uh, someone who was very, very motivated and craving knowledge. She welcomed me into the classroom and introduced me to everyone. She was excited. What she didn't understand was the whole idea of staying there. And I had no way of knowing how to explain that to her. At the end of the school day, Someone ushered me into the dorm room where I met yet another new person, the dorm supervisor. Then she showed me to my bed and she showed where my suitcase had been placed and all I saw were girls and bags packed in the room. It was all so overwhelming. It was at that point that I noticed the teacher and my dad were making eye contact with each other and I didn't really know what was going on at that point, but my dad got up and started to make his way towards the door. Once I realized that was happening, I knew he was leaving, and I ran and chased after him, and I screamed, no! I had to pull her off of me. She just cried and cried, didn't want me to go. She's scared. She, she, she likes the place, but she doesn't know what's going to happen. I was so upset and crying, and my dad was crying, and he was telling me I needed to stay, but I didn't know what to say to him. I didn't know what was going on. I thought maybe if I apologized, that would help. Maybe he was angry with me. But of course, I couldn't tell him that. And the teacher just pulled me aside and held on to me as my father left. 
I think she thought she was being abandoned. In fact, I, I know that's exactly what she thought. She was going, she was being abandoned, that mom and dad don't, they're, they're getting rid of me. Uh, they're throwing me away. And, and I walk out of the place and I get in my car and I'm just crying like a baby and I think, you know, not just what does she think of me, but is this really the right thing? I mean, letting go of my child. How can I nurture my child if she's stuck in this institution down in Indianapolis three hours from home? What, what kind of a father does this to a child? But I had to keep thinking and telling myself, you know, how can I nurture her if we don't have any kind of language to share? I need to get back and start really doubling down on sign language. I need to do something. I was very anxious while she was there the first week and I'd look at her bed and she wasn't there in the evening and just, you know, pray she's okay. And, and she'll be home this weekend on the bus and so we'll, we'll have some time together. And... I do remember it was a Friday, I guess, and I didn't know at the time it was Friday. It was just another day for me. But I was there in the classroom when I was pulled forward to follow someone out of the room. I don't remember now if it was the dorm supervisor or just another staff member, but I followed them all in the room. And they brought me to an area where there were other kids seated, and they told me to take a seat. I noticed then that my suitcase was sitting there beside me, which threw me off. I didn't know why my suitcase would be there again, but I sat there and waited with the other kids. At some point, someone came in and gave some instructions, which I didn't understand. So I followed that person outside and saw a big charter bus parked there. Again, I didn't realize what was happening, but I just followed along with everyone else. And there were so many older kids on the bus and they were just signing back and forth and I didn't know what was going on. That's when a small girl asked me to sit with her. She seemed to be about my age. It was obvious she knew what she was doing there, but it was all new to me. The bus took off, and we were traveling. It seemed like forever, and the sun went down. It was getting darker and darker, and I didn't really know what to expect. The bus would stop, and kids would get off the bus, and then we would carry on down our journey. Again, the bus stopped just to the point where there were a few kids left. Finally, the third stop happened. It was so dark, and the little girl next to me was getting excited and ready to get off the bus. And that's when I saw my parents' car parked out in the parking lot, and I was so excited. I couldn't believe I was back home again. Whatever had happened this last week, it didn't matter. I was back home, and that's all that mattered. I was able to get out and hug my parents. We had a wonderful weekend, and then it was time to take her back down to the bus. I saw that my things were being packed up again, and I realized that I was going back to school, and I begged and I pleaded. I did not want to go back, but my parents told me that I had to go back to school, and I tried apologizing, and it was really hard on everyone. Three of the words she knew were, me be good, me be good. You know, she didn't want to go. I'll, I'll be good, I'll, I'll be good, you know, please. I thought it would be better if I went down on the bus with her. Then I could come back on the bus and everything. So I went on the bus, but she knew as soon as we turned the corner and she saw the school, she just started screaming, Mommy, no, Mommy, no. I got off of the bus with her wrapped around me like that and talked to her and tried to best I could explain to her but I couldn't even get her to look at me. She was clinging so tightly. She just had her head here and was wrapped around my neck. And um, one of the teachers came over, you know, was trying to talk to her and, and help her, and she just kept crying. And the teacher eventually had to take her and just pull her away. And I had to turn around and get back on the bus and sit in the bus and cry for three hours on the way back. Within about three weeks, she began to understand this routine. And that's when it dawned on me. This was the place, the other place that I was meant to live. I would come back to school with kids who were just like me, and I would learn more sign language. And then I would go home on the weekends with my parents. My parents would be there. 
Once I realized that that's the way it was going to be, then I immediately understood, and I fell into my ASL groove. She would look at something to indicate that she wanted to know what it was. She just wanted to have a language, and she was going to do anything and everything to access it. The way most of us hearing people learn is we have a whole bunch of vocabulary words before we ever go to school. Learning to read is simply a matter of, of attaching this shape to that concept that you already know. For Rachel, she needed to have some kind of a different language method so that she could learn what that concept was or what that thing was in sign language. And then she could learn what the shape looks like. She had this babbling piece, which is really important for language development, we know. But she was also, through American Sign Language, she was able to make sense and put the piece of babbling goes with this English word, and this English word is understood by seeing it in American Sign Language. She was just a sponge and she took everything in and she started figuring out how to sign things, how to say things, and it didn't take her very long to acquire both languages, really. It was as if I had a glass of ASL and I just drank it down completely. I was picking up signs, asking teachers and friends what different signs were in my environment. I just couldn't get enough of it. When I got home, I was all excited and ready to show my parents what I had learned and they were struggling to keep up with me. From that point on, they're language users. From there, it's learning new concepts, learning uh, various syntactic rules, like how to make questions, how to make passives. She was able to express what she felt and what she needed, and so she was happier. And all of that frustration that was built up inside for those first few years because she couldn't communicate it was gone. She knew now how to communicate. Her parents were communicating with her as best they could. And so she didn't come in with a blank slate. I think she had a lot of information, but it's almost like a puzzle with missing puzzle pieces. And so coming to a fully accessible program allowed her to put those puzzle pieces together. And it was pretty quick. I would say within a year, she was off and going. I can't imagine really any other person better than Diane, who led me, well, into my first few steps that led me into who I am today. My cultural identity as a deaf person and realizations that I had through that process and the pride I have in who I am now. She valued me and she told me that I could value myself and I learned that from her. I think another big piece that I'm not sure people understand until much later and that piece is having other deaf role models around these children. To go to a deaf person and say, okay, what do I do about this? Or how do I do this? Or what are your thoughts on, what's your experience? How did you learn about this? Or how did you solve this particular problem? I think that is something that is priceless. And because a school for the deaf is completely accessible to a child, they are gonna be seeing the language the entire time from the moment they walk in the door to saying good morning to the secretary, walking down the hallway, talking with their classmates, signing with their teachers. They have total and complete access. So I just was on everybody, learning as much as I could and building my vocabulary as fast as I could. I would get home and try to show everyone the things that I had learned. Four months later, when she came back home for the summer, we were as a family at an event, we're doing some camping. We had put her to bed and gone back out, you know, the grown-ups were talking, and we went back in to check to make sure she had gone to sleep. And she was signing in her sleep. You know, signing, dreaming in language, in sign language. 
And then of course we realized if signing is her natural language, if she's gonna talk in her sleep like anybody might do, she's gonna talk with her hands, not with her mouth. That's the moment we were looking for. That's the point where she begins to acquire this language and she thinks in it and dreams in it. Now we've got a tool to work with. Now we can start figuring out, I mean, how to communicate with her in, in better ways. And we'd been getting some private sign language tutoring and uh, getting the books and watching whatever videos we could and trying to learn the sign language. So we were, we were doing rudimentary signs and we were learning a lot from her. So we'd ask her what the sign is for that. And she would say, chair, chair. That summer she learned a lot of English and we learned a lot of sign language. Uh, and she told us a joke. Her first joke, two men walk out in the woods and they're gonna chop down trees. And the first man comes and says, chop, 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 chop. And then go, timber. Now Rachel doesn't know what the word is really. She's about, the tree falls. So they go to see the next tree, big tree, big tree. So the lumberjack went chopping after that tree, and after a few moments, the lumberjack yelled, Timber! And the tree fell. And then it was after lunch, and they decided to go back to another tree. Third tree. So then they go, chop, 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 chop. And the lumberjack kept chopping that tree. It was taking more effort than it did the first time. And he yelled, Timber! One more time. But nothing happened. Tree doesn't fall, it stays there. Not sure what to do, the lumberjack yelled, Timber! Again. But again, nothing happened. So then he pulled out the card with the manual alphabet on it and he started to spell T I M uh, B E R. And sure enough, the tree fell. And then she says, You know why? 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 Say me, deaf, deaf tree. And she did it with such a smile. She was already beginning to take pride in her deafness. The fact that she was part of this group that she belonged to, she had pride with that. There's nothing wrong with that. And she, so she started to see her capabilities. And that was a pretty cool moment for us. It's the possibilities that we wanted her to see. Before Rachel came along, I knew that there were deaf people, but I had no clue about their lives or their worlds, or, or I didn't know a single deaf person, never met one that I knew of. They were there, but they certainly weren't a part of my world. And when Rachel came along, that changed everything for us. Because when we take her to the deaf school and we begin to meet, this whole other world that we didn't even know was there. I mean, a culture that is so fully developed, it's very much like a foreign culture. They use a foreign language. They see the world completely differently. So I started to see the world differently. I found how isolated they were, at least from things like spiritual development. I had seen the transformative power of faith in my life and in many people's lives. How can I share with this child about this thing that has been so critical in my life since I was five? How do we communicate to her in, at these early ages that God is relevant to her in her world as it is, in this silent world, God is still relevant. I mean, God loves her as much as he's ever loved any human and that her life can be enriched by knowing who this God is and having a relationship with him. So that was, that was my biggest concern. And so while I was always engaged in ministry, I was always writing Christian songs and doing these things. Now with Rachel, I recognize it's a whole different world out there that needs to have some kind of uh, uh, opportunity that they typically would not have in a local situation like where we live to learn about things that I thought were really critical for her to learn about. 
that's one of the reasons I was so excited when I saw that she's signing in her sleep. Hey, now we start, now we've got something. We've got a language here. Now I got to go find some people who, 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 who know this language and we're going to, maybe I can find some videos or something, you know, to teach her about those things that I care about, like Bible and, and, and faith and stuff. So I, I go to my local library. Surely they've got stuff, right? And all they had was Mother Goose. Mother Goose is okay, but it's not enough. And she couldn't watch television. And, I mean, she couldn't understand what, with kids' television, what was going on. The best thing out at the time was Veggie Tales. And Veggie Tales, great, but you can't read the lips on a talking cartoon cucumber. And I really started burning inside of me. What can I do? I gotta do something. We've gotta have some help because I don't know the language well enough myself. Gotta find a way. So I had this friend who was working at Anderson University and he was doing video. And I thought, man, this is cool. I'm gonna drop in on him and see if he can give me some ideas of how we might be able to do some videotaping of some Bible stories. I can get some people together and we could go do it and how much it would cost. So I just dropped in on him one day and I didn't call ahead. We had been pretty good friends. I thought he'd see me. And I got there and his secretary said, I'm sorry, he can't see you. See, he's gonna be editing all day long and they had these people from out of town and they've driven significant miles to be here and they just, they're here for one day. But if you can come back tomorrow, I'm sure he'd be happy to see you. But today, he, he just can't. I said, well, can you at least give me the nickel tour? Because I haven't seen the new facility on the campus. She said, sure. And I came around the corner and I saw a video monitor. And as I looked at this monitor, I saw a bunch of people signing sign language to this Christian song. And I turned to the secretary and I said, well, well, what's that? She said, well, that's what they're editing today, see? So I said, I've got to meet these people. So I barged in and my friend Don was just happy as a clam to see me. It's fine, it's okay. And I went right up to these people and said, do you have anything like this for kids? Because that's what I need. I'm a father of a deaf child. She's learning sign language. Do you have anything like this? This woman was the founder of an organization called Deaf Opportunity Outreach. And she was working with a guy who was uh, uh, the videographer at Deaf Missions, two deaf organizations. And she said, well, you know, we wanted to do something for kids like this, but the royalties that we're paying for these songs is just so much higher than we thought, and we don't have the budget. So unless we can find a songwriter that would work with us and write some songs, and then we, maybe we can do it. And I said, I can do that. I write songs. I've written some stuff for Sandy. I've written some stuff for other people. I, I can do this. That started my first steps in the journey of actually being engaged in deaf ministry. I've always loved the story about when you and my father met up and how it was just so much evidence of God's existence and how he was a part of everything and how everything unfolded. Really, it's just part of his plan. I had gone down and sat with the deaf folks there at Deaf Opportunity Outreach or DOOR. They had written some sign songs that they were doing. And so I watched them and um, made sure that I understood the sign language and everything and then just kind of created music around them and lyrics to fit the way they were doing what they did. We had these little songs called Special Me, Special You. And uh, uh, my my friend, we, I, I said it, my friend, but the sign language is me, he, Jesus loves me. That was my first experience trying to write songs for deaf people. The crew from Anderson University came down and they shot these songs and edited them together and it was so exciting. It was set up something along the lines of what a summer camp might look like for deaf children. We came together and it was the first year that anything like this had happened. 
I was six at the time. I was actually the youngest person. She loved being there, and those people were such great people. They were wonderful mentors to this child, and great mentors to me, too. We just moved along with the taping and not really understanding the importance of what was happening. But we did develop really good relationships with the kids. I think I still cry when I see it because I still see little Rachel on the stage. And it was just super cute. And I was still doing my concert tours on the weekends, still working on the radio, in the radio station. On the weekends, I'd go out and do these tours. And I was up in Racine, Wisconsin, and there was a family there that was sitting in the back of the sanctuary. And they had three children, and one of them was deaf. So I'm going to give a videotape to this kid. Well, I guess it was about three weeks later, I got a letter from her mother. And she said, I just wanted to tell you that our daughter just loves that video. And at home, at the dinner table, generally the children take turns praying, but uh, I will sign that so Sarah understands it. But whenever we ask her to take a turn to pray, she, she would refuse. She said, you. So we didn't understand this, but okay, whatever. So somebody would pray and at night when I put her to bed, I would say, you pray, you pray. Said, no, 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 you, 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 you. We couldn't understand this. So finally, when we got your video and she watched this video, When she saw this, she got so excited and she ran into the kitchen and she said, Mommy, Jesus knows sign language. Wow. And I read that and I just started to cry. I realized what she's saying. This little girl had never seen a prayer that wasn't spoken. You know, they were always spoken. If they were in interpreted or signed, it was, it was interpreted for her. But you're talking to Jesus with your lips. And when she saw this little boy was talking to Jesus without lips, then she said, whoa, Jesus knows sign language. I can pray too. I didn't think I had a voice. I have a voice this way. And uh, the PS at the bottom of the letter said, now she won't let anyone else pray. Now that she knows, she has access. She wants to pray all the time. That's such a powerful message for all deaf children out there, really. They need to know that Jesus understands them. The relationship is what's important, not the language. They have a direct connection to Jesus. Rachel loved the deaf school. She did enjoy it. Until she got into the third grade, and then she started exhibiting some behavior issues that we hadn't seen before. I was always a sensitive child. And I think that because of my sensitivity, it was really difficult for me to be so far away from my parents. It was okay that they lived in a different place. That's not what bothered me. I didn't have to physically be with them all the time. But when I was faced with new emotions, I just didn't know how to deal with it. It was around that time that I started to become more, I don't know, impetuous, just kind of doing my own thing. At the same time, I think I was also trying to mask my own feelings of inferiority. And so I started to act out, just doing whatever I wanted to do. It was in the third grade, I think, that my parents started to see that something was going wrong. They knew that I loved to read and that I loved to do my homework, but then they also saw that I was putting things off and I was becoming antagonistic and arguing with people and teachers and fighting with other kids. My parents didn't know what to do with it, especially because of them living so far away. They didn't know how to make things better for me. So until we could figure out what was going on, we thought it was best to bring Rachel back home and put her into the local ASL program that they had in our school system. At the deaf school, my experience was that we had classrooms that were of the same age. 
all the kindergartners together, all the first graders were together, and so on. That wasn't the case in the school that I was going to now. They were divided up with K through third grade and fourth grade through sixth grade, and I just didn't understand how to fit into that. Being a third grader, I was placed in the K through third grade classroom. And I can't tell you how frustrating it was. I felt like I couldn't progress at my own pace at that point because the teacher had to hold everything up to teach to the kindergartner or to the first grader what they needed to know, even just simple basic things that I already knew. The teachers would hand out assignments or homework in the classroom, and I remember looking at the homework thinking, this is information I've already done. I took care of this last year at the deaf school. I remember this from the deaf school. And unsure what to do, the teacher just told me I had to do it anyway. I don't remember how long I was actually in that classroom, but I want to say it may have been about a month. And the uh, teacher said to me, we've done the testing for Rachel, and she is on or above grade level at every single subject. And she looked so, so puzzled when she said that to me. And I thought, is this a, that's a bad thing? It, it, that's a good thing, right? That, that's good, right? So, oh, oh it's, 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 it's great. But well, see, we've never had a, a deaf child in our program who was on grade level in any subject. So we don't quite know what to do with Rachel. I mean, she's a third grader, but she's reading at a sixth grade level. She's reading at a level that's higher than our sixth graders. It was interesting, I think, for me. At that time, I felt like I was almost becoming a tutor to my classmates. I was teaching them. And I attribute that to the fact that I had a strong ASL foundation and I was able to help them. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it, but it's just interesting. I felt responsible to teach them and to make sure that they understood. The teacher was great, but her resources were limited. The program itself wasn't a great program because it couldn't meet the needs of each child. They just had to do what they could. As the year progressed, and we started getting some of the test results back, and we found out what was going on with her, it wasn't that she was being abused at the deaf school or that there was any kind of problem, particularly with the deaf school. It was more that she was starting to exhibit signs of attention deficit disorder. And so since we had come to the root of the problem and we were pretty confident that the deaf school was not the problem, we asked Rachel if she wanted to stay in the local program or if she wanted to go back to the deaf school. It got to the point where I talked to my parents and told them I had to go back to the deaf school. There just wasn't any other alternative for me. We had the individualized educational plan that they put together for all special needs kids. And for the first time, we saw the guy who was the titular head of the program for the local school system. And he said, now, what we're going to do here today is to determine where Rachel's going to go to school next year and make sure that we have a plan in place that will do well for her. Well, the laws in Indiana at the time were that Terry, my wife and I, could make that decision where, where she wanted to go to school. And if the local school system had a problem with that, then they could uh, file a, a suit if they wanted to, but they typically wouldn't do that. But we knew what our rights were as parents, because you, you need to know that if you have a special needs kid. We get in this meeting, and he makes this opening statement. I said, well, Terry and I have already decided we're gonna send her back to the deaf school. We've figured out what we needed to figure out, and we're, we feel really comfortable with that. He said, well, Mr. Lawrence, that's what we're gonna decide here today. I said, no. No, we have the decision, we've made that choice, and that's what we plan to do. He said, well, why would you want her in the deaf school? I mean, she's isolated there, just around deaf people all the time. She doesn't have any normal kids that she could play with. Why would you want her to do that? So I said, well, when she's at the deaf school, she's learning in a way that's most natural for her, and she's, she has deaf role models all over the place who are successful people. And when one of those deaf role models stands up in front of her and says, kids, you can become anything you want to be. You can do whatever you want to do. If you put your mind to it, you can succeed in this world. She's going to believe that. If she's in a hearing classroom and a hearing teacher gets up and says, 
You can be anything you want to be. She's going to filter that. She's going to say, no, 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 no. In, my, in her mind, she'll think she's talking to the hearing people now because I'm obviously different than they are. So she's talking to hearing. I can't be. I'm, I'm limited to what I can do. I said, I want her to think and to understand that she had, she puts more limits on herself than anybody else will ever put on her. And she can uh, aspire to great things. And he said, well, Mr. Lawrence, really, I mean, what, what would, what do you want her to be? I said, anything she wants to be. If she wants to be a teacher, I want her to be a teacher. If she wants to become the president of a university and she wants to, to aspire to that goal, that's what I want. And he just chuckled. He said, Mr. Lawrence, there may be one, maybe two universities in this country where she'd have any chance, a deaf person have any chance of becoming the president of the school. So I said, sir, I hope you're wrong about that. But if you're right, it's because of bigoted attitudes like the one that you just expressed about my child. And if I had any doubt that she was going back to the deaf school, it is gone now. She's going there. After it was over, I turned to the teacher and said, oh, I hope I didn't hurt your feelings. I think you've done a wonderful job with Rachel. She said, no, I was just crying because I, I wish more parents of deaf kids would stand up for their kids like that. They don't. And they're just so intimidated by the, the administrators and the schools. And, and they, they've always, you know, gone there for answers or the local doctor or whatever. And, and uh, they don't understand that they have to be stronger. They have to. She said, I have other kids that need to go to the deaf school, but their parents would never say what you just said. I, I wish you could talk to them. I wish you could come in and advocate for those kids. So back to the deaf school I went for fourth grade that fall. And I was happy to be back there at the deaf school. I was really excited. Then one week later, I saw a kid that had transferred from the K to third grade class to the deaf school. And another week later, there was another kid that transferred. And then one more after that. That same year, I think two more transferred and they all graduated from the deaf school. Once Rachel returned to the deaf school, she was back in her element and she did very well. I remember when she was in high school, she was very athletic. She was a cheerleader. She was involved with different sports. She was a very pleasant, spirited young lady. You got the feeling of energy and support and love for everyone around her. She was extremely popular, very bright. During that time, I remember the school was trying its hardest to break through and start some new initiatives, a program perhaps for drama. That idea of theater grew amongst the students and kids started to look forward to being involved in it and excited to be involved in it. I had some friends who encouraged me to be a part of it as well because they knew that I loved acting and drama. And they egged me on and I thought, well, okay. It was almost by dare that I got involved. And once I did, I realized that I actually really loved drama. My senior year, 2003, we finally had an actual production, a theatrical production. It was such a cool experience. Once I found myself on stage, I finally realized that this is it. This is my niche. I think Rachel's interest in drama really started with that first special me video when she was six. She went to several of these through the years with Door. And every time they had a new project, you know, they'd call me up and say, hey, can you write some things for this? Working on these projects showed me the great need for a ministry specifically for deaf kids. So we formed Silent Blessings. The point was to get into television. Can you imagine? A dramatic show that could get into anybody's home? That was the way to reach out and grab and make a connection with the audience. So we developed the idea of a show called Finger Food Cafe. Well, hi there. Nice to see you. You're looking good today. Come on in and welcome to the Finger Food Cafe. Are you deaf or hearing? Either one is A-OK. -okay. 
You're sure to find a friend here. The concept of the television show was that there was a deaf restaurant owner and a hearing father alongside him, and the hearing father had a deaf daughter. I would say it was loosely based on the relationship with my dad. It was set up to be both deaf and hearing friendly, where everyone worked together. They wanted a song about the deaf experience, something that would share what the relationship would be between kids and their parents. I remember my dad came to me and he asked me questions. The questions were about my experiences, my journey, and he just wanted me to use my own words in that description. At that point, I didn't know that he was wanting to find lyrics for a song he was writing. I didn't know anything about that. It wasn't anything that we discussed. I just thought we were engaging in conversation. What did you feel then? And what, how did you think about this? And, and how did you feel when you went to the deaf school the first time? And all of that, what, you know? And I told her how we felt. So after we had that, those conversations, then I wrote this little song called Silent Blessings. My father gave me the lyrics and asked me to read through and to tell him what I thought. I couldn't believe it. I was so touched how eloquently he captured my experience and everything that I had said to him. It was just amazing the way he put my journey and his journey both into that song. And as it was, it was ready to be signed. No interpretation needed. So it was time for the Finger Food Cafe to film that particular song. We were there on set and my memory is that it was after a long day and my dad and I were both tired. But it was actually a special moment that I remember vividly. Even though we were there with camera operators and lights and the set around us, everything disappeared for us. And in that moment, it was just he and I. Silent blessings, music too sweet to be heard. Silent blessings. Too wonderful for words in his wisdom. When he's given half a chance, God can take our circumstance and do great things. As people watched that song being signed, it was a powerful moment. But really, the point wasn't about the song itself. I think really the main point was the relationship shown between my dad and myself and that my dad isn't deaf, he's hearing. When deaf children saw this, it moved them too. They knew that it was something that they wanted. They were sad and wished that their parents could sign as well. They would come to me and say, I wish you could come talk to my parents and tell them that they needed to learn sign just like your parents did. One of the lines that she signed was talking about how frustrated she was, but at last I came to see that my hands could be my voice and unlock the world for me. It was hard in the beginning Cause I had so much to say Though I tried to share my feelings I just could not find a way But you made the hard decisions And at last I came to see That my hands could be my voice And unlock the world for me Silent blessings, music too sweet to be heard. Silent blessings. At that time, I remember things were really difficult. I was in my adolescence, and there was a time when I would say my dad and I did drift apart. It wasn't a time where we were as close as we had been before. We butted heads quite a bit. And I think that's probably just a normal part of growing up. But I'm gonna say that it was that moment, that night, the filming of that song, where the two of us came back together in a nice way to reconnect. She was our silent blessing, and she ushered us into this whole world we didn't even know was there. But it was an incredible blessing to us. It, it was, you know, something that the deaf community needed and something that he needed as part of his journey as a father. 
When Rachel graduated from the School for the Deaf in Indianapolis, she wanted to go where many of her friends were going, to Gallaudet University, which is the only liberal arts four-year college designed for deaf people in the world. I think we both felt like she probably wasn't ready for college yet. Her biggest handicap, if I can use that word, is attention deficit disorder. Which, by the way, has been a much greater problem for her through her life than the deafness ever has. It was kind of hard for her to get finished and have the grades that she needed. I thought she could have used another year of kind of seasoning before she headed out there, but she wanted to go. She was determined to go. So I took her out there and we got her all registered and they had the orientation time. And I walked in the cafeteria. It was filled with kids, you know, all these deaf kids sitting around tables and just chatting. I didn't see very many parents in there with the kids. I guess maybe they took to heart what was being said, leave your kids alone. And, but I wanted to spend lunch with Rachel. So we, we got our food and we went to a big round table. They're all round tables. You know, deaf people love round tables so they can all see each, each other easily. So we sat at this round table and we started eating and, and just kind of chatting. And I didn't notice it at first, but little by little, one by one, our table started to fill up. Other kids either finished their food or they came over and just watched our conversation. And then a ring of other kids kind of filled out behind the full table. And a third ring of kids were starting to be there. Now we weren't talking about anything terribly personal. It didn't, it didn't bother me that all these kids were kind of watching our conversation. But I saw this one kid with kind of a tear in her eye. And she tapped Rachel on the shoulder and she signed, you lucky, your dad signed. I wish my dad signed. And, I, and the other kids at the table were looking at dad and saying, yeah, yeah. And again, you know, that just, just killed me. I think in general, people are just surprised to see that it's my dad that's fluent in sign language. That is so rare. Typically, it's the mothers in the family that learn to sign because they're the ones that are more nurturing with the children. So when people see that my dad is the one signing, it's pretty shocking. And I don't know why, except that it's hard to do and it takes some time and you've got to put in the energy. Or maybe it's just too easy a shortcut to go through a sibling or to go through mom if mom knows. But it is a, it is a constant theme in the deaf community that 90% of them, 90 to 95%, say the statistics, are born into hearing families, and only a few of the fathers, particularly, ever learn enough sign language to have any kind of conversation with their child at all. Deaf people would tell me that my dad reminded me of their dad, but that they could understand my dad. So I think some deaf people may look at my dad and think that they're reliving some type of dream that they wished that they had had a father who signed. But that was normal for me. This was my life, and I can't imagine not having had that relationship with my dad. I see so many deaf people who don't have that relationship with their father, but I know it's something that they want. And so I had to share my dad for those few moments with people, which I was happy to do. So I entered Gallaudet, and it was fall. And I have to say, I really enjoyed myself. I was involved in the theater there. It was just so much fun. I had the time of my life. But still, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my future. I had no real goal set at that point, and I didn't even know where to begin. But I spent a lot of time hanging out with friends and people, and that's really where my interests were. I just thought, this was the way life was. And I would say I was enjoying myself. C'est la vie. There was definitely some partying going on and spending a lot of time with people, so much so that I ignored my academics and really had nothing to show for it academically. Nothing. I became very angry and I decided I didn't want to follow my faith. I didn't want to follow God. I just kind of put that on a shelf and did my own thing. I couldn't remember a time when God wasn't the center of my world, the center of my life. It wasn't like I thought about God being separate from my family. That was never the case. 
God was always a part of what I consider to be family. That being said, it was superficial. I didn't know enough about God to have a personal relationship with Him. I knew that I loved Him, but not really what that meant. I had a hard time sometimes asking the right questions or figuring out what to ask to help me with my faith or to grow in my faith. And it was at that time that I was in a relationship, something I call that relationship. While I was in that relationship, I believed so many lies about myself and about my self-worth. I believed I had no value at all. None. I believe that it was that relationship that was pivotal. God used it to capture my attention, to say, look at me, look at me, Rachel. I love you. I made you. I deeply love you and I want you back to me. So that relationship that was bad and broke my heart showed me the type of healing power that God had for me, love I never thought was possible. Complete grace, total forgiveness. Everything was forgotten. And it was that relationship with that guy that had such a huge impact on me. I could have never gone through it alone. I didn't have the power to do it alone. I had to depend on God. So I left my boyfriend, and then soon after, I found myself moving back in with my parents. And I decided, it's just me and you, God. And at that point, I was interested in just God. No more romantic relationships for me. I was beginning to wonder at that time whether or not I would ever get married. This was when I was living in Kansas City where the deaf community was very small and I knew everyone there and there wasn't anyone I was interested in. That was when my dad asked me if perhaps I wanted to join in working with his ministry. And I decided to. And the first thing that I was asked to do was to go to the ASL Expo that was taking place in Kansas City. This is a big event for the deaf community. A lot of expected participants with vendors and exhibitors that set up booths to promote their products for the deaf community and accommodations for the deaf community's quality of life. I was getting my booth ready when the company next to us requested to have two tables end to end, which meant that I would need to change positions of where my booth was set, which I didn't mind doing. I moved over to the other side of this company, which actually landed me right next to Silent Blessing's table. My dad stepped away right as the door was opening and people were coming in and I wasn't sure what I would say to people if they asked me questions and sure enough. I slowly made my way over to the booth next to mine and I saw the booth was actually for a deaf ministry. Also, there was a beautiful young woman there, so I struck up a conversation with her. He started to ask me about what was going on at Silent Blessings. I tried to explain what I could, but he kept probing and asking more, and I said, Could you come back later, please? I don't really know the answers. So I did just that. During the day, I took every opportunity I could to talk with her. As I was standing at the booth, two guys walked up to me, one of whom was Jamie. I didn't know who the other one was. As the three of us were talking, I noticed that the other guy seemed to be a little more dominant in the conversation. He almost was pushing Jamie aside and forcing my attention on him instead. At the time, I remember thinking to myself that I didn't like this guy's pushiness. I really quite preferred Jamie's quiet demeanor. He just sat back and let it all unfold. He knew what he wanted. I think that's something that I was really attracted to. Apparently, for a long time, I looked for the opposite type of guy, someone who didn't know what he wanted. But this absolutely got my attention. So I just waited for the other guy to stop, and I thought, this guy here is an example of the type of relationship I was not interested in. Then there was Jamie, just standing there in stark contrast. Throughout the day, I learned more and more about Jamie. I learned that he was a chiropractor, he was deaf, on top of which, he was also a strong Christian and single, which was interesting. And I just want to say, knock it off, God. Not cool, God. I had prayed that morning and asked God to meet a woman. The woman. 
And sure enough, I did. Here in front of me, I immediately saw this is a man of faith. Not only that, but a man with integrity, which is just so surprising. You don't see that nowadays, really, anywhere. In the deaf community, to see someone who's a strong believer is unique. And single? Wow, that's rare. I very vividly remember nudging my deaf cousin, Ryan, and pointing Rachel out and saying, there is something very special about her. <laughs> I do remember that. After the expo was finished, I went on my way home and realized I had no way to contact Rachel. I was at my parents' house watching TV. My dad was laughing, and I could tell because I could see my dad's legs moving up and down and his feet jiggling around. And so I looked over, and he was just having a good time reading something off of his phone and talking to my mom. And that's when he handed his phone to my mom who looked at it and started laughing too. I knew my dad was having a good time, but my mom had a very specific kind of facial expression going on. Kind of like, you know what's going on. It was very deliberate, and I was having a hard time figuring out what was happening. Curiosity was killing me. I had decided to do some investigative work and look on their website. And on the website, I found a general way of contacting them, so I went ahead and took a chance, and I sent an email to that general address to see if I could get Rachel's email address. So they handed the phone to me, and my dad said, you have an email. I thought to myself, I have an email? Why would I have an email? The email said, Hi, my name is Jamie. I met Rachel at the ASL Expo and found that she was a wonderful person, and I'm just trying to get a hold of her. I don't have her email address. Would you mind forwarding this email to her? Mom looked over at me. I really think that you should email him. So I want you to get up now and go to that computer and send him an email. I was indignant. I was like, Mom, you shouldn't be like this. You should be protective of your little girl. Then mom said, well, you know, your dad met him and took a look at him, and he liked him. And so I guess if dad likes him, I like him. There you go. I thought, thanks, mom. I didn't realize that email went directly to her dad. So my gut's telling me, from the first time I met her, my intuition told me, that this was the one for me. But I was relaxed about it. I took my time. I wanted to get to know her more and get to know her parents better. And I became more involved in her life by volunteering in her dad's ministry. I contacted her father, Marshall, and asked if he and I could have breakfast together. Her dad knew what was happening. Her dad knew I was about to ask to marry her. Then we talked about it, and I asked him, and he immediately said yes. Just perfect. I had talked about previous relationships and how I remembered that those guys didn't value or respect my dad. I realized that that's something that was important to me. We decided to get married pretty soon after that. In fact, the next October. And it was a simple ceremony. We had it outside in my uncle's yard. We were so excited when we found out that Rachel was pregnant. We decided that we wanted to choose a name for our child, a name that wasn't necessarily after a family member. We wanted something to honor our firstborn. That's a unique position in the family. We went back and forth because we wanted a good, strong name. We told my dad that we were going to name our son Marshall after him, after his grandfather. And of course, he cried. That made Grandpa feel really good. Kind of the good housekeeping seal of approval, I guess, that we did okay. We didn't, didn't mess her up too much. I think that any deaf person would have conversations with anybody in their life, really. 
as to whether or not their child is going to be hearing or deaf. That's a very natural conversation to have. Rachel and I agree that regardless of whether or not our child was born deaf or hearing, we would accept the child as the gift from God that he intended it to be. So it was explained to us the laws regarding that early hearing detection test that happens within the first 30 days of a baby's life. We didn't really care about that. If our child was hearing, then okay. And if our child is deaf, then an early detection isn't going to change that. So for the first 30 days, we just went about being a family. And then the day approached, and Jamie and I remembered that we needed to schedule the appointment for the test. And we did so on the 30th day. Our child passed his hearing screening test, and Rachel and I were fine with it. When he was three months old, Mars's first sign was milk, and I completely overlooked it. I thought that he was actually too young to be signing, but looking back, he absolutely was signing. He was signing milk, but I didn't do anything to reinforce it at that time. I just kind of thought it was a cute little baby babble. And then he stopped signing milk. A month went by, and I noticed that he was moving his hands in the air like this, which looks a lot like the sign for all done. And I would sign it back to him and reinforce that with him, and he was signing it. Babies sign like you think a baby would, but he started to use his signs a lot younger than I think a lot of children do. He was actually communicating with me. Later, he would sign diaper in his own way. It wasn't exactly signed properly, but I knew what he wanted. We needed to change his diaper. I mean, he was six months old. It was amazing to watch this happen. Almost overnight, we were communicating. I know he was communicating before most babies even speak. Mars, in his own way, was learning how to call me and get my attention. I remember, for example, Mars was in the bathroom sitting on the toilet and he needed to call mom. He needed more toilet paper. And he tried to call my name out and of course, I didn't hear it. I was in the kitchen cleaning dishes and cooking and such and he tried yelling my name again and he was trying to get my attention. So I went into the bathroom because I just had that mom instinct that things were too quiet. So I went searching for Mars and I found him sitting on the toilet. He said he'd been calling me and I said, well, calling my name isn't going to work. That's when he asked, why? Well, I couldn't hear you. Oh, well, then how do I get your attention? That's when I started suggesting things. I said, you could throw things, you could bang on the wall, maybe I would feel the vibration, or even flash the lights. He and I sat there and talked a long time about it while he was still sitting on the toilet, and he said, good idea, Mom. There have been times when Mars and I were talking to each other. We notice people looking at our conversation. And I'm wondering what they're thinking. Are they thinking that this child, Mars, would be delayed in his language and speech? There was this one guy. He was very direct in talking to me about this. That was unusual. Hearing people aren't usually that direct when they approach these types of questions. He was asking me how Mars was going to learn English. And he and I were talking. We have a good rapport, so I didn't mind the questions. I didn't feel offended by them at all, and he went back and said, no, I'm serious. How is he going to learn English? And really, Mars gets quite a bit of exposure to English. He gets it from people at church, and also from our friends and our family who are hearing. I have no concerns about his English development. Hearing children of deaf parents are just fine just fine. There's no evidence that there's any impact on the children's speech, their English, or anything like that. We expect totally normal behavior and language and accomplishment out of them. He's a very, very bright kid and bilingual. He's very creative and expressive in English and likewise very creative and expressive in ASL two very different languages that he's able to use. I know one young man who has uh, English, Taiwanese, French, and American Sign Language, and Croatian. 
and he's fine. His father's Croatian, his grandparents are Taiwanese, his mother is American of Taiwanese descent. She's fluent in French. She's an American Sign Language professor at Gallaudet. Her children do just fine. Five languages, no problem. Linguists see this all the time. Most people don't see this. I just can't wait to see how God is going to use Mars. He's already used him so much in my life and has used him in Jamie's life as well. My hope is that Mars becomes someone who can do good in the world. Do a good job of explaining different cultures to other people and the challenges of those cultures and to help bridge that gap between the hearing and deaf cultures. Being a CODA, a child of deaf adults, means that he's in a unique position. He'll have a unique understanding of the two cultures. Now, sometimes CODAs will talk about bad experiences growing up. That does happen. But Rachel and I hope to give Mars a better experience and that he grows up as a CODA who can use his experiences for good. My dream is that I want to see him become a man of integrity and honesty. I also want to see him become a compassionate man. I want him to own his own faith, his faith in Jesus. It's much easier for Rachel and Jamie to be able to teach Mars about God's love because they share a common language. Terry and I will never forget the Sunday morning when we first realized Rachel was beginning to understand that God truly loved her. So we would go to this hearing church in Goshen, Indiana, which is close to where we lived. There was no deaf church there. Deaf churches are pretty rare, particularly if you get outside of a major metropolitan area. In general, when deaf people go to church, there won't be an interpreter there. And there won't be other deaf people there in the church as well. And it can be so isolating and boring for that deaf person. It's typical for a deaf person to sit there and watch people talking and flapping their lips and get nothing out of it, and in fact, get very restless. I remember my parents would try to sign to me, and my mom would sometimes draw pictures for me and point to them, trying to illustrate what was happening during the church service. I depended on those pictures to learn what I could about the sermons and the Bible and the topics that were being discussed, but really most of it just flew right over my head. I would just sit there for an hour and a half during the sermon, during the hymns, and the worship, and I would use that time to people watch and to watch people's behavior and look at their clothes. I think most deaf people would have the same story. For special events, where there might be bells ringing or things like that, I could see the actions, but I couldn't really benefit from them, and I wasn't really intrigued by them. I do remember one time at Christmas, the pastor called all the kids to come down to the front and sit near him on the stairs. And so the kids went down, and I followed them just like any other child would, and my dad went down to the front pew and asked someone to move over so that he could sit down and he was preparing himself to interpret as best as he could. The pastor said, what's the best gift that God ever gave you? And of course, all these kids are thinking, well, hey, you know, God gave me these skates that I just got, or he gave me a pony, or he gave me this. So the kids are answering basically what they got at Christmas time. And uh, so I signed that to Rachel. What's the best gift God gave you what? I just said the first thing that I could think of at the time. It's not something that I thought about. I just threw it out there. At the time, I had no idea what kind of meaning or impact it would have on other people. I just said what was true for me. And she thought, <sighs> my deafness. I was watching my dad waiting for him to say something, and he got choked up all of a sudden. His eyes started welling up with tears, and he clarified with me, did you just say that? And I said, yes. <laughs> I just went, <laughs> you know, and start to cry. And I said, wow, your deafness, really? Yeah. I said, why? 
makes me special. Makes me special. I didn't realize why my dad was having such a strong reaction. But I looked at my pastor's face, and he looked incredibly shocked. I looked around the church and the kids, and they were all looking at me too. Later that day, I thought back at what happened, and I realized at that moment that people saw me differently than I did, and that my deafness was truly a gift. That was such a powerful moment for everybody there, the congregation, the kids on the steps. They had previously seen me as the poor little deaf child with a hard life, but then this deaf child just said that that deafness was a gift. They were truly astonished. I was seven when I made that comment about my deafness being a gift from God. I'm much older now, but I still feel the same way. I look at the world now much differently than I did. And I look at the details now differently, because I am different. And I think that's beautiful. As a deaf person, I know now that I'm unique, and I have unique things that I can offer the world. And this part of me that's unique is something that will be and has already been used for God's purposes and for His glory. And I think that's something that I've always known since I was a child. That deafness and the community and the world I live in is cool. And I love it. And it makes me special somehow. I'm a special kid. Yeah, she is. And yeah, they are uh, among the most amazing people I know. Just a little baby When your mom and I first learned You would never hear the music In the way we'd always heard So we started on a journey Though back then we couldn't see What a blessing and a joy Your life would be It was hard in the beginning Cause I had so much to say Though I tried to share my feelings, I just could not find a way. But you made the hard decisions, and at last I came to see that my hands could be my voice and unlock the world for me. Silent blessings. Music too sweet to be heard. Silent blessings. Far too wonderful for words In his wisdom When he's given half a chance God can take our circumstance And do great things Gifts from heaven Can arrive in many ways Some with fanfare And applause but sometimes his silent blessings are the greatest gifts I 